From the Fathead Studio in Speedway, Indiana, this is The Skinny. Oh, there you are, sweet Jesus. Come back to Papa. <laughs> the highs and lows, you know, are just uh, can be pretty brutal, that place. But, you know, I think that's what is so fun about it is the challenges. I saw Will Power smack the wall out of four with 10 to go. I mean, I... He's still going. Dixon? No, 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 no. Connor. Oh, Connor, yeah. Yeah, Connor. welcome back to the Connor. show. Yeah, Connor. Connor and, well, you got to pick a direction, pal, and I'll stick with you. Oh, I don't know there. I, you lose track about halfway through. I go to move when it's full of methanol. Both of them are full of methanol. <laughs> Pop, big bang. I turn around, and the glasses are smoking. And it goes, whoa, good thing you gave me those, right? <laughs> I'm Scott Dixon. I'm Antron Brown. Hey, I'm Ron Cap. I'm Connor Daly. I'm James Hinchcliffe. I'm Paul Page, and this is The Skinny. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. We're excited. We have a great guest that's in the studio here today. I'm Ken Stout. That's Rico Elmore. The track dude will be part of this show here today because he's been friends with him for a long time. Now, typically, I would announce who the guest is inside of the studio, but I thought, hey, why do that when he's better at it than I am? So here's what I want you to do. Picture it's 1990, Memorial Day weekend, Sunday, about 12 o'clock. You turn on the TV, and this is what you would hear if you're watching the greatest spectacle in racing. Hello, I'm Paul Page, and it's race day in Indianapolis. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the most iconic voices in our lifetime, for sure, in all of motorsports. When you hear Paul Page talk, you think of people like Tom Carnegie. You think of Sid Collins. You think of Bob Jenkins. You think of those big names that made everything right in the world whenever you came on TV and you were watching one of those huge events, man. We, we're so excited to have you back in the studio. That, that's quite a list. I hope I can live up to that one. There's, well, you've some, already lived up to it, my friend. No pressure. guys there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, first of all, congratulations on a, on a career that spans some 30 years. Um, to stay in this industry, you know better than all of us, uh, <laughs> man, bobbing and weaving throughout the shark-infested waters, and, and to make a living out of it yeah. is no easy feat, and you did a great job at it. Well, it's, it, you're exactly right. You're, you're dodging bullets almost all of the way, and uh, as announcers, uh, you know, we're always waiting for that call, hey, uh, I think we need to make a change which means that that producer has screwed up, but he's not going to take the blame for it. So we have to make a change. <laughs> Finally, somebody on our side. <laughs> right, right. Is this like the car, the driver? It's always the car. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the driver's going to blame the engineer. Yeah. The engineer's going to blame the driver. And yeah. yeah, that's that's exactly <laughs> right. Uh, and, a, and a wildly diverse career as well, which we'll dig into a little bit uh, during the show. But for the, uh, for the fans at home... Uh, probably associate you with motorsports more than anything else, and certainly your voice in connection with the 500. And uh, researching you a little bit, much to my surprise, I was not aware of this. I know Sid Collins um, is very important to you, your life, and, and your mm -hmm. career. Uh, but I did not realize that he created the phrase, the greatest spectacle in racing. That I did? No, no, no. Or he did? S Sid Collins did. Actually, no. As the secretary at Fairbanks Broadcasting, the WIBC. Is that right? Yeah, they, they had an issue. They didn't know. They, they weren't able to throw a cue to the network. Of course, it's a very young network, and I hadn't thought that one out. And so uh, I, their name was Alice Banks. And they were just throwing it around the table in the sales office. And they said, well, she's, well how about this? Stay tuned for the greatest spectacle in racing. Boom. There it was. There it was. Sid picked right up on that. Sid knew something good when he had it. Now, I, I do apologize. I said he created it, and that was incorrect. I should have said he coined it. Coined uh, it. I believe, he certainly I did. That's was, true. was the that, phrasing. That goes without saying. So that's yeah. pretty cool that you know how that phrasing started, because to this day, it's still in use. Yeah, and it should remain in use. We only changed it once, you know. We changed it in the um, early 90s. Uh, the president at the time, John Cooper... Pull, pulled me into his office, and he said, hey, you know, we are not just the greatest spectacle in racing. We're, we're the greatest spectacle in the world. So uh, uh, I think the cue ought to go that way. Uh, so let's make it stay tuned to the greatest spectacle in sports. Really? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm sitting there and thinking how I can tell him no, and I couldn't figure it out. So one year we used that particular cue. He left. And I turned it back immediately. <laughs> uh, I can't think of a better phrase 
for that event. We have constantly we talked about it so many times. Rico has a suite out there. He's certainly a big part of, of that day. Michael's been covering it for so many years. You were a part of it for so many years. But we've all tried to describe to friends who have not been to that event mm. what the feeling is, the electricity. It's, it's a heavy it's, it's in the air. It's a heavy weight. It's inexplainable to me. I can't put it to words, but it is something so palpable that um, it, it feels like it's a real thing. Mm -hmm. the, well, the, the entire event, as you well know, is, it is it, for radio, it's really hard to contain, really hard to, to explain what's going on out there. And, and you're right. We often forget that the 500-mile race, because we're motorheads, we're gearheads, and we like it, for some people, they never even see it, but they're there. And that, that's part of the other love for it. There's, yeah, it may be all one event, but there are a lot of people, they, everybody approaches it a little different. And as you well know, many people have their own traditions race morning as well. You know, I, I go to my grandstand by getting off the bus here and walking over to here, and I say hi to this refreshment stand. It's, you know, everybody's got something. It's interesting you were talking about, uh, you know, the... Uh, there's a lot of people that have traditions and then there's a lot of people, there's some that come that, that go that never see it. Yeah. And, and so somebody was asking me, somebody that was at our suite, we ended up, I was taking him around on the golf cart. And I said, I said, uh, right over here is a snake pit. They're like, Oh, we've heard of that for years. I go, not the same snake pit. <laughs> they killed the snake pit. They killed the, they killed the snake of the did snake itself. pit back in the day. Yes. Did itself in, but, uh, I said, but, you know, the cool part of it is they've got, you know, 40, 50,000 people in that thing yeah. that they're doing over there. Um, and I said, just think about it. If 1% becomes a fan, you're building the fan base. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, love, I love what IndyCar or the Motor Speedway has done in the way of, making an event, not just a race, mm -hmm. but an event. And people go to the event. They may not be race fans, but they go to the yeah. event. So go yeah. to see several hundred thousand people. That's that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's always an interesting hundred some thousand yeah. interesting people. So <laughs> and, and that's part of that energy that I was trying right, exactly. to talk about before. I mean three hundred thousand people there and you think of the history, the drivers that have lost their lives there, the drivers that are about to put their lives on the line there, and I mean and throw caution to the wind. It's the biggest race on the planet. And and those guys want to win that thing. It's uh it's unbelievable the pageantry that goes on in the front of that race. I'm, I'm telling you, fans at home, it's a bucket list item. If you love motorsports, if you don't love motorsports, you just love big, exciting events, you absolutely have to go to the Indianapolis 500. And this man was a key part of it for a number of years. We're going to take a quick break here. I told you his career was very diverse. We're going to touch on a little bit of that when we come back. And I walked in the station and said, it's just giving you one of those. Like, oh, my God. He said, that is the worst interview I've ever heard. <laughs> the Skinny is brought to you by Toyota. Toyota, let's go places. Lucas Oil. Lucas Oil, keep that engine alive. General Tire. General Tire delivers. And Fatheads Eyewear. Fatheads Eyewear, hardcore since 04. Welcome back to The Skinny. We have Paul Page, who's joined us here in the studio. Born in Evansville, Indiana, still lives right here in the Indianapolis area. Awesome to have somebody like that come in here, a true historian of the sport. And, of course, this race here that we are so passionate about, that little thing called the Indianapolis 500. But his career didn't start there. It was, uh, it was a long path, and he dug deep from the bottom. How does a young man who was an Army brat, some 10 to 12 different high schools mm -hmm. along the way, end up at the Indianapolis 500. Where did you start off at? Well, I actually started in high school. Our, uh, they, there was a thing every Saturday for the local high schools to come to a station, Waukee and WKRG, and and do a you know, report, uh, the team's doing this, whatever. Well, that kind of hit me. I liked it so much that I'd hang out and finally made friends with like all the engineers and learn how to run a board and everything. And before I knew it, I was a board guy there. So then I went to the Army. It, uh, it took me for a while. And uh, when I came back, I came directly to Indianapolis because I wanted to be near the race. I, I had no idea what I wanted to, 
to be in the race, parts washer would have been just fine. Anything to be near the cars. <laughs> and uh, ended up uh, working at WIBC as a newsman. I, I wanted to be a disc jockey, but yeah. Um, so Sid Collins. Be careful a, what you wish for. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Sid Collins was a sports director. And uh, one day I had done an interview and I'd sent it back to the station. And it was a, a soapbox derby interview. And I was really proud of it. And I walked in the station and Sid is just giving you one of those. I'm like, oh my God. And he said, that is the worst interview I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> so. There, there wasn't anything there, but after that, he mentored me. He started teaching me, and, and, but he'd always say, but there's no room on the network. And then in 1974, he said, you know, there is room on the network, so let's give it a shot. And, but he guided me through all of that. And so, worth noting, we're just talking about local news now at this point, and mm -hmm. you spent uh, a number of years covering that in some super cool events. I mean, the president came here to Indianapolis. You were part of that. JFK, mm -hmm. part of that deal. Uh, so, uh, I mean, you were, you were in the thick of it uh, at the start of your career. Yeah, um, with some pretty interesting stories as well. Uh, one of them, uh, the Sylvia Likens murder trial, which, you know, that's been a book and a movie. Um, I liked hard news. I really, en really enjoyed working hard news. Uh, and I ended up having a, um, a car for 24 hours. That's my car. And the responsibility was if there was a big news event, be there. So, yeah. And then I went into the, to the Whirly Bird, and we still were doing news up there, though we were mostly doing jokes up there. But it was, <laughs> it was fun. And you say up there, well, you've got to tell the story. It wasn't always up there. No, no. It, uh, it, it, it retired. He retired. <laughs> he retired on, early. <laughs> yeah, on, well, on December second, nineteen seventy-seven. Not that you remember these kind of things, but uh, yeah, we were passing over the North Forty, and then had a big click in the main rotor system. We were heading for the airport, heading westbound, and uh, then we heard another click, and then it started down. And I'm thinking, I'm cool because it's got auto rotation. Well, I suddenly realized I'm looking at a one of the rotors, and it's just sitting still. And for the fans at home, I have a really good friend of mine who was captain of a gunship, so I do know what that means. But what is auto rotation? Well, auto rotation is is that you don't necessarily have to have an engine; you just resistance against the rotors. And uh, as long as you keep the aircraft's attitude right, it, it's going to land for you. It might be a bump, but you know, it's it's a way to get down without having the engine. But if you don't have the rotors spinning, eh, now you got a problem. So down you guys went. Yep. 500 uh, feet uh, right over the top of Speedway High School. I thought we were going to hit it. Um, and we uh, ended up crashing on the track at Speedway High School, which has a fire station on its west side. And they dispatched themselves. They saw it happen. And so they came ripping over. And that, that probably, we didn't, we didn't have a fire, which was very amazing. And I kept expecting that. I was doing everything I could to get away from fuel. But uh, we... We were lucky. Somebody was looking out for me that day. Yeah, it might sound like an odd question, but did you survive? <laughs> uh, part of me did. <laughs> but no, just... Actually, you know, that's, that's funny because it's listed. You get this certificate. It's a non-survivable crash. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> three of us. Well, we didn't walk away, but we crawled away from it. <laughs> so there, was a, there were three of you in the helicopter. I remember you saying it was a fairly small aircraft. Yeah, a Hughes 269B model, which is a mosquito you know, and yeah, we had uh, the, the pilot and a photographer and then me. And uh, what type of injuries did you the guys The other succumb? two uh, had pretty serious back injuries. I, Ike from the Army, I knew I didn't want to be in an aircraft like that if it's even auto rotation. So somewhere in there, I took my belts off so that I wouldn't be kept in the aircraft. And I did go through the front bubble, uh, just cleaned out the plexiglass because witnesses said that uh, but then the helicopter kind of jumped over and, and landed essentially right where I was because the main rotor head was like right here and um, the other two guys because they stayed in the aircraft they were kind of dangling there um, because I had that happen I had pretty serious injuries to my left leg and uh, but otherwise you know little cuts and bruises and it was fine and you say pretty serious injuries I mean your left leg was yeah, Not it was, I, my foot was dangling from my Achilles tendon. Yeah, I didn't like that. <laughs> it's a bad day. Yeah. It's interesting, you know, you talk about Paul's career and covering news. 
do you mind telling the story of the night that uh, you were covering Bobby Kennedy when he was in town? <clears throat> yeah, you're talking about the, um, the change? Yeah. We're, actually, that was, yeah, Bobby. Yeah. Um, so I'm at WIVC, which is at 2835 North Illinois, and catacorner to us on, on Meridian Street is the Marat then Hotel. And I'm watching television in, at, at the news desk, and I'm all alone in a station, and um, Lyndon Johnson is up, and he says, I'm not going to run again. I'm great. I got, I got the other candidate right across the street, so I grab my car, I run over there, and just as I'm kind of skidding to a stop, the elevator door is open, and here's the staff coming out. I said, I, I need a comment on Lyndon Johnson not running again. And they looked at me, and they just a minute. <laughs> they, went back up. they didn't know. They went back upstairs. <laughs> oh, wow. I should have pursued that a little more. <laughs> yeah. So wait a minute. Can I go with you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we're going to take a quick break here. As we talked about, he's been in this industry for a long, long time. So I want to ask him the biggest differences between then and now. We're used to all the toys that we have now. He didn't have them back in the day. <laughs> Trying to figure out. Who was where it was often often interesting. And let's say 19, uh, 1979, we lost track of the race. Welcome back to the skinny as we have Paul Page has joined us here in the studio. And when Paul Page got going, well, let's just say it was safe to say that he did not have live timing and scoring. He did not have track segments to know who was where at any given time. You lose somebody, ah, you just look at live timing and scoring and you see where the number of the car is and you look in that general area. You were able to look at a screen now and you know who the leaders are. Whenever they get mixed up in traffic, you still know who the leaders are. But back in the day, it was nothing like that, was it, my friend? No, not like that at all. We didn't have any computers in those days. And the only thing I had other than the announcers out on the track was like an 8-inch monitor that had the production output of ABC, even though they weren't on the air until later in the day. But, um, yeah, trying to figure out who was where was often, often interesting. And let's say 19, uh, 1979 we lost track of the race. Now, the timing floor is directly below us, but we, we lost track. None of the turn guys, or they, after a series of pit stops and everything got jumbled, and we're like, you know, what am I going to do here? And timing and scoring, they didn't know. <laughs> and now what are we going to do? So I sent the pit report. So you're talking about talk. you, Sack. Uh, <laughs> yes, I am. As a fact. <laughs> but um, we got the pit reporters to go talk to some top teams and ask, where are you? What what position are you in? And we rebuilt the field field by that. And then finally, timing and scoring figured it out. Timing and scoring, you gotta remember then was like thirty three chairs. Right. So they each, oh, yeah. each person had that's what I was gonna ask you. So their one person was dedicated to a car. To a car. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, every lap they come by they, part of the deal was they would write a number down that it was on a, on a clock, not a time like minutes and seconds, but just a number. And that could all be then later, if you had to rebuild the race, collated. And then you had uh, uh, chart scores in both North shoots, and, and you could rebuild the race. But for broadcast, you had to do it right then. And that, 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 once we got the computers, like, oh, this is heaven. And now I go into the booth on race day, and, and the, it's, it's amazing. You thought you those computers have on there now. Yeah, the only right. thing I always wanted, you know, right there. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, it's everything you always wanted and, and more. I mean, I, I sat in there. I had the pleasure of calling the Nashville race uh, for IndyCar this past year. And to sit in there and look at that monitor, which it has a couple of columns. First of all, everything's abbreviated. So mm -hmm. you need to know what the abbreviation yeah. means. And then there's a couple, two or three of those columns that roll over. And they, they give you different kind of information. Yeah. So... Uh, it'll tell you the last time they pitted. It'll tell you how many laps they have on those tires. It'll tell you it's a wealth of information yeah. if you know what the hell you're looking at. Yeah, because exactly. Because it's pretty complex, and, and it happens, as you know, extremely fast. And I know you didn't have that back in the day, and, and I often wondered. I didn't know they had 33 different people dedicated one to, to each car. And then so they would have a lap chart with 200 laps, I guess, built out at it. Mm -hmm. And every time their car crossed stripe, they would write it down, and then they would correlate they that would write with the some sort of down. time. Yeah, and uh, then that was not necessarily at that moment. They, they knew where they were just based, based on both the numbers showing up and 
the general the order of things generally was pretty good enough. You, you knew where you were. And there were two uh, chart scores that would keep track of it. And they were the ones you, you really needed to go to. But again, with the pit stops in those days, uh, you know, they were wild. There was no speed limit in the pits. And uh, so it, it was pretty crazy if you got a round of pit stops or something. And uh, you finally had to get a really good chart score to deal with that. I, I used uh, Barbara Hellyer who is still around, uh, runs uh, the old-timers, the 500 old-timers. She's the best chart scorer ever and solved a, a major controversy for us on ESPN one year. So, wow. So that's that's what we had to deal with it. And so were they using stopwatches as well, or, or did you guys use them in the booth at all? Yeah, we did. And in, in fact, uh, when they <laughs> – I'm really old. <laughs> when the digital <laughs> stopwatches were coming out, we'd had mechanical, two in a rubber sure. case. Uh, when the digitals came out, oh my goodness, we're perfect. And with with all the racers, we'd race ourselves. We, it, it'd sit there and you, okay, I got that's that's seven thousandths of a second. Right. Yeah, and we'd race one another. But uh, in 1982, here come John Cock and Mears, and I'm timing their interval, and I realized about the 191st lap that that interval is steadily closing, and I got on the line to the to the guys and I said, hey. We got to watch. These two are it, and I'm telling you right now, they're going to be side by side on the white flag lap. Well, you're able to predict that, so that was cool. But even cooler was the fact that when they crossed the line, I clicked them, and I was almost dead on. And you had to because that didn't get generated up at all right away. So I, was, I got the number, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that? I mean, it's such a great feeling too to have that information that nobody else has. Yeah. And, and now you're confident in that information as well. So yeah. it's a special feeling for yeah, sure. It really is. Though in today's world, you'd love to see what some of the teams have because they take all the same data, but they have all these special adjustment programs so they can, they can interrogate even, even deeper and more efficiently. So well, they're getting I, car telemetry, which all mixes in. Yeah, and you're exactly right. And, and I mean, what they do today is uh, it's just mind-boggling. Uh, just the, the fuel number alone yeah. that they're constantly relaying to the driver, literally lap by lap. Where yeah. are you at? They want to know from him where he's at. Oh, you're good. Oh, we need you to hit this number. And mm -hmm. I love it when, you, you know, as a spotter, you hear, you hear the box tell the driver, uh, we need you to hit this number. Um, try to pass this guy in, in front of you, you know, and then you'll have clear track. And yeah, the driver's like, well, stay on this number. Yeah, you, <laughs> you can have one of those, but you can't have both of those. So, <laughs> you know, you said something interesting there. When we were doing it for a long time, there were no, no spotters. Oh. The radios barely worked. You know, it was enough to maybe hear the driver on the front stretch. So, no, there are definitely no spotters. Yeah, another piece of technology <laughs> we just take for granted, yeah, right? Yeah. And, and they had, that's when the signboards were critical. The drivers yeah, were living absolutely. and dying on signboards. Absolutely. They, that's where all the information came from. And, you know, they get the relay from pit side. They pits hold up a board. The guy would replicate it on his board and hang it over the wall. I did that once. Not at Indy, but at Michigan. I used to have an Armco barrier up close to the track. And I was I was hanging out with uh, Big Naughty and John Cock and Dolan Beck, and so they said we our guy didn't show up. Would you go up there? Okay. And I was never so scared in my life. I mean, I, they were you know 20 feet away, and fortunately the car I was signaling fell out about lap 10. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't cross over until a yellow because I have to come down the grass and over the pits, and I'm like, please, please get me out of here. <laughs> Exciting stuff. Love to hear how all this stuff developed over the course of time. It is super cool, and that's why we love to have guys like him around. Stay with us. When we come back, we're going to pick his brain a little bit about some of the other items that he's broadcasted over the course of his career. I'm doing the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest, and the very first one, they uh, started the, the event. Now they just, you know, count down and say go, but then they... They said, gentlemen, start your enzymes. <laughs> so it, it was fun. The Skinny is brought to you by Lucas Oil. Lucas Oil, keep that engine alive. Fatheads Eyewear. Fatheads Eyewear, hardcore since 04. Toyota. Toyota, let's go places. And General Tire. General Tire delivers. 
Welcome back to The Skinny. I'm Ken Stout. That's Rico Elmore, the track dude, heavily involved in this one as well, as he's been friends with Paul Page for many, many years. Paul Page, a Grammy-winning broadcaster who has covered much more than motorsports. And a couple of those items, which uh, we had the pleasure of having him on the show uh, before this became a TV show, but a couple of things that jumped out at me were... Uh, speed skating. You said you really enjoyed that. You said you enjoyed America's Cup and the technology in there really blew your way. But let's face it, when you're winning Grammys, it's got to be the Nathan's Hot Dog Contest that really put you on the map. I, I think those are Emmys, but okay. Oh, Emmys? <laughs> okay. I'd like to win a Grammy. Sorry. I didn't mean to do that. But. No, it's all good. I would take the Grammy. <laughs> well, you were obviously heavily impressed with that long list of obscure events. Um, yeah, Nathan's, they, they called me one day and they, at, at ESPN, and they said, we got this new series. It's, 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 it's not really a series. It was going to be a one-timer, uh, and we'd like you to host it because you have a sense of humor and can handle these kind of things, which is kind of where they use me a lot of the time. And so there I am. I'm doing the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest. And the very first one, they uh, started the, the event. Now they just, you know, count down and say go. But then they, they said, gentlemen, Start your enzymes. <laughs> so it, it was fun, and it was popular, and it became a Fourth of July tradition. I did, I think, thirteen years of wow. it, and it was a hoot. It, it was a really good gig because you also, at the end of the day, I book a, like an eight o'clock flight home out of Kennedy, and the reason I picked that time, even though the event was over by about two, was on in that time, if the sky was clear, you could see all the fireworks down below you all the way home. It was really. It was I know exactly light. what you're talking yeah. about. I'm sure you've yep. experienced as well. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So, what years was it? What years was Nathan? Nathan's. I'm sorry. Um, I want to say 2005 as a starter. It all jumbles up. But uh, I mean, I've been in too many different jobs. <laughs> yeah. So was so was Joe. Who was the who was the star of the show then? Well, um, they, there was this Japanese eater, name is Kobayashi. Yep. And um, but that was his last year, and then we got Joey Chestnut, who has basically won all of them ever since then. Who lives, by the way, up on the north side of Indianapolis? <laughs> who would have guessed, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah because he always does the shrimp eating contest, right? And, oh uh, yeah, yeah. For St. Elmo's or whatever, right. and yeah, yeah, I. I guess I didn't know that he lived up there. I want to well, know what's going on. Well, that's a new thing. Most people there. don't know that. That's that's really new. He's so, gonna he's gonna get like stalked now. People yeah. are gonna... <laughs> <laughs> so, did you find yourself intrigued? I mean, coming out of the motorsports world, you knew how important little tricks of the trade are to win uh, any sort of motorsports event, and the same rules apply when it comes to eating hot dogs. They have tricks of the trade. Yeah, I uh, I had to go to go to the pits and find out the story from the from the competitors up front. Um, each of them has a special drink. One of them might like iced tea, one of them might Kool-Aid, because that's what they dump the dog into. Well, and they soak the bread, right? Soak yeah, the they bread. soak the whole yeah. thing, and then they throw it in their mouth. So that was important, finding out what each guy, what their favorite was in the cup. Um, that uh, Joey, for one, chews five pieces of gum at a time to in, in, uh, you know, strengthen up the jaw. That you can overcome your gag reflex with training, and so they'd work very hard at doing no that kidding. as well. They, I mean, they take it seriously. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and how, how many hot dogs were they consuming, do you remember? Oh, I think the last, the record is, I think, 78. Oh, but, my God. But they didn't have, and that's you know, 10 minutes. <laughs> I, you know, I, I think I've got this laid out. The next business meeting I have to go to, <laughs> I'm going to try to rent him. <laughs> It just it, it not to, and introduce him to someone else, and let him come in there and just start smashing hot dogs. They'll <laughs> never forget that meeting. No, that would be good. How would they forget that? We uh, in the Monster Jam shows we had uh, we had an entertainer, uh, short of basically like a rodeo clown, if you will. And during intermission or between classes, he would come out and, and do some uh, some stuff to entertain the crowd. And one of the things he would do was a banana eating contest. Mm -hmm. And he would he would structure it so whoever won the deal would end up eating four, if not trying to work on the fifth banana. And let me tell you something, eating four bananas is no easy task. I mean, so if they wanted to cut the hot dog eating contest in half, they could go to bananas yeah. because for whatever reason, man, I mean, it fills you up well, fast. But racing racing had their deal. 
whenever we'd go to Ontario, now Fontana, right off of Archibald there, going to the Ontario airport, it was a, um, um, oh, this is good, hamburgers, California hamburgers. Uh, in and out. In and out burger. In and out. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, we all know that one. <laughs> and we'd, uh, we'd have a contest after the race. A bunch of the guys would go in there and see who could eat the most, the key being you had to keep it down. And I think one guy got five, and that was it's, there was no time limit, but five was amazing. Yeah, you know, double double garbage was. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, I mean, I could only do five or six, but I get it. I mean, <laughs> it sounds like a big deal. But that was after a long night. <laughs> after, a, after a long night, and I didn't know I was even doing it. So. <laughs> It, it's such fun stuff, and the events that you cover as you're a house guy for the network. So uh, much like, you know, you see Lee Diffie these days, you'll mm-hmm. see him covering uh, the Olympics, of course, you know, mm-hmm. or wherever it is that they happen to send him. Now, fortunately for him, that's still racing. I would find that very exciting. Mm-hmm. But as a house guy, you take the phone call. The last thing you say as a broadcaster is no. Yeah, your your contract is written, mine was, and most of them were uh, on 32 events a year. And, well, there aren't. 32 racing events so they wanted to fill up the other so they'd send me to all this you know sumo wrestling and i did the rubik's cube championship world championship from uh the opera hall in budapest for example but the good news about that was you got to travel they'd send you i've I've been places i never would have thought i'd go to and just because you had that opportunity exciting stuff how about a million miler on three different airlines this man has covered the world we'll touch base on it in just a moment the books hardcover books for uh one of them was the highest was 79 dollars. wow that's yeah, so awesome that doesn't come to the author though i was just gonna <laughs> where's it go yeah <laughs> how does that game play? I, just like racing it goes somewhere else <laughs> yeah. oh my oh my god i didn't Welcome back to The Skinny. Hey, make sure you check this out. Hello, I'm Paul Page. It's race day in Indianapolis. That's why we had him do the uh, the start of the show to this. Of course, the book, you can get it on Amazon. There's a couple of different venues where you can get it, but easiest probably is, is uh, Amazon. And uh, I just saw you make a post on Facebook. There's a reprint that, that just is coming yeah, out. Yeah, there's a second printing of Amazon. It, it sold out. Oh, wow. So um, there is a second printing that will actually hit the stands the first week of December. And uh, so it'll be on Amazon about that. I went on Amazon the other day just to see what was going on, and they were selling the books, hardcover books, for uh, one of them was, the highest was $79. Wow, that's yeah, awesome. So that doesn't come to the author, though. I was just going <laughs> mean, to, where does it go? Yeah. <laughs> How does that game play? It's just like racing. It goes somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my oh my God. I did not. I know nothing about that world, yeah. but you're kidding me. So you, they can raise the price, and you just get well, whatever. yeah, and then, you know, private people that have bought it and hung on to it and hoarded them, then they go back through Amazon and sell them as well. So oh I've seen goodness. it listed at $182. I'm pretty sure no idiot played that much for it. If you did, I apologize for calling you an idiot. You're <laughs> super send nice. it to him. He'll sign it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a soft, this one was a soft cover that he happened to bring in for me here today. And uh, uh, very, very gracious for, for that as well. But as you mentioned it, the hardcover is available. Yes, it is. And I hope everybody it's Christmas. It's a time I'm, I'm I'm just saying, you know. <laughs> a million miler, you've covered the the entire world uh, when it comes to motorsports. And uh, we talked about America's Cup, and you mentioned that before, all the technology inside of it, uh, the Formula One of, of racing, if you will, when it comes to sailboats. And uh, I know uh, Rico Rico's interested in your involvement with NHRA, and you covered them extensively for, I want to say, the better part of five years as well at the top tier of that sport. Uh, where, where's your passion lie for that? Well, I, if, if you bolt a motor to something and get two of them and put them side by side, I'm going to watch it. Indy cars, you name whatever. I had always liked drag racing. I, I was here right after, as a kid, right after Indianapolis Raceway Park opened, you know, in the U.S. Nationals and everything. So I always enjoyed it. It was kind of the one motorsport that I could not know enough about so I could enjoy, and there was some mystery. Uh, and then they assigned me to drag racing. I'm like, this is great because I really, en- I really enjoyed it. And for me too, it was, uh, it was like, uh, like IndyCar Champ Car then was in the old days, where they didn't have, they don't have, and they, drag racing doesn't have engineers or big deal sponsors. So when their day is over, they 
pull out the grill, get some burgers, talk, hang out with each other. And I, I like that atmosphere. And I, their competition is unbelievable. Very cool stuff. All right, we have a little bit more coming your way here. Mr. Paul Page in the studio with us. Stay with us. When we come back, we're going to pick his brain and find out if he has any favorite moments when it comes to racing. All of a sudden, he'd come flying out of the middle of the crowd and just gives me this really big hug. You know, oh, thank you, thank you. You know how he is. He's so effusive. But The Skinny is brought to you by General Tire. General Tire delivers. Toyota. Toyota. Let's go places. Lucas Oil. Lucas Oil. Keep that engine alive. And Fathead's Eyewear. Fathead's Eyewear. Hardcore since 04. Welcome back to The Skinny. We're in the Fatheads Eyewear Studio. I'm Ken Stout. That's Rico Elmore, the track dude back behind the controls here, and Mr. Paul Page sitting alongside. Great to have you with us, my friend. And, uh, boy, it's always great picking your brain. And there's so much in there that's, that's buried uh, with well, all the you. work and all the years along the way. And I'm going to kind of put you on the spot here. I know there's one special moment, and if you don't bring it up, I will bring it up. But I want to ask you... Uh, what. What do you still find most attractive about this sport? What do you love about the job? Maybe some of the most important memories that, that you acquired going throughout your career. Well, I, I love it just because I'm looking at great stuff and stuff that I absolutely love. I mean, I've had that passion since, since 1960. So um, great moments. That, that's an interesting question because is it my great moment or a great moment that the audience had? And they're two different things. Uh, my all-time favorite was uh, John Cock Mears uh, on the radio, just because we had predicted what they were going to be on the last lap. And you could literally hear where the two cars were by the crowd I'm sitting in that old control tower. I, could, I knew where they were. Um, I, I, I've especially liked lately being in the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Radio Network booth uh, on race day, and they're very kind. They, you know, let me come in and make a fool of myself, and you know, I'm the old guy in the back. But, uh, and I, in to that end, uh, the 100th race, I really enjoyed, in part because I couldn't convince either Davy Hamilton or Mark James that there's a chance that Rossi could win this thing. And it's like, no, he's ninth. I said, you know, you got to trust me on some of these things. He's ninth. So I finally just pushed my button. I said. Got to watch Rossi. You really have to watch Rossi. And wh what I knew is that I knew how their fuel, the whole system works. When you're looking at his speeds compared to the nine in front of him, and it, it had to happen, you know. But finally, finally they figured it out, you know, because you can't communicate with the other announcer and they're focused, so it's hard to do. But I, I really in, enjoyed that particular moment and watching him win, especially since the fuel strategy for that race was done for Rossi by my son, Brian, who's a performance engineer at Andretti. So it's like, my son won the race. I don't know about this Rossi guy. But <laughs> what a, and what a special moment that yeah. has to be yeah. as well with, with, your, with your son involved. The, the one moment that I wanted to bring up that I know is near and dear to your heart it was the one with Elio. Yeah. Um, Elio, you may remember, had serious tax issues. And... I kept trying. I, I had serious tax issues at one time. And so he and I would talk and, you know, what to expect, what's here. I was fine. They, the IRS finally gave, gave up and said, you know, you haven't done anything wrong. So I'm telling Elio, here's what to expect. Here's the next call you're going to get and all that. And, of course, he finally uh, was found totally innocent of anything at all. Uh, and it, it was a bit of a, I didn't like what they did to him because uh, they, they manipulate him. Uh, and they, they do that on, uh, on April 15th. They really love to announce some big deal person is going to get charged with something. So anyhow, he wins, and I'm out of the booth like a shot because I'm, yay, <laughs> he's weathered the storm, and now he's down there, and I went down. I'm just standing there on the ground, and all of a sudden, I'm, I'm waiting, you know, for the crowd to clear and you know maybe I can talk to him all of a sudden he comes flying out of the middle of the crowd and just gives me this really big hug you know oh thank you thank you you know how he is he's so effusive but uh that was that was pretty special except for the fact you know they really sweat when they're racing <laughs> <laughs> especially that one right oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. A few, Hot a day, few, 200 a few, laps yeah a few hours in a capsule yeah. 
no air. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it's such a special moment, and that's what I love most about this sport. Um, you know, when you initially get into it, you're thinking fame, and you're thinking money, and you're thinking all of these cool things in your head. But what it always evolves to, for me, are the people. It's people. It's yeah. the people, and and they become an extended family. He knows all too well. Michael knows all too well. I know, I know you get it as well. But uh, for me, short course off-road racing for so many years, and man, I became best friends with people like Carl Renazetter and Johnny mm-hmm. Greaves and these incredibly great drivers, yeah. you know, that walk up and, and they just talk to you. I mean, these guys are my heroes, you know, and right. they, th- and I'm just a friend to them. I'm just another guy to them, which is, you know, super cool to have that, that special relationship with these drivers. Yeah. The same, same th- sort of thing for me is when I started, especially because AJ Foyt, Johnny Rutherford, those are huge names yeah. in my world. Those, those are guys I want to get autographs of. And now I could come up and they would actually talk to me and it'd be a good conversation. And, and we become friends. Uh, Johnny Rutherford calls all the time. He just called a couple of days ago. Oh, that's great. But, you know, that's you transition from being the fan to being part of the community, and then you realize how really special that community is, how tight-knit it is, despite all you may see on TV and everything. Like you said with drag racing, it's a tight-knit community, and if something happens, you know you're going to get taken care of. I, I caught a bad case of the flu once, and was flying home, had to make a stop in St. Louis, and there were a bunch of the IndyCar folks on the airplane and I was really in, in trouble and boy they just surrounded me took care of me got everything for me made sure I got on the flight okay and that that's the community that's the family and I, I love that yeah there's there's a lot to be said about that like I said even the biggest outsider you know is is an insider mm-hmm. you know when it comes to that community uh, IndyCar uh, of course is much much the same but the NHRA, you're talking about, you know, your heroes, right? Yeah. And I, I mean, I don't know that I, uh, you know, had a hero in in John Force, but <laughs> I definitely, definitely respected what he did right. and thought he was pretty amazing. And you know, Caps, Height, all those guys. I mean, these guys, Cruz, Pedregon, of course, been with us a long time. But now those guys, you know, I get a random phone call from Force at eleven thirty at night yeah. because. He clearly doesn't realize there's time zones, <laughs> just just like Uncle Bobby. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uncle Bobby, I'd be laying in bed, it'd be 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. Hey, pastor, or whatever, he would call you something, father. Hey, father. Mm-hmm. I'm, like, I'm, like, I'm like, hey, Uncle Bobby, what's, and you don't just not answer his call. Yeah. And, and it was, it was always, and I'm glad I answered every one of them, but he, he uh, the, quite the storyteller. So you, you spoke two names there, Forrest and Unzer. Yep. John Forrest in between rounds, and we only did the pro rounds, so we had some time out too, would come over to the TV truck and we'd sit on the stairs and I'd tell him Bobby Unzer stories. And he just loved every minute of it, you know, and, and he'd show up, not, not all Bobby, but he's always show up once, at least during the break in between rounds at one time. And, and what an <laughs> That's another guy like Bobby. They broke the mold on that one. He's super. Hey, man, can't thank you enough for coming oh, in here. Thank you. We always enjoy having you in here, and, and your stories are absolute TV gold, and uh, thank you for all the memories, you know, all along the way. Your your voice and your, your knowledge, your presentation, everything that, that you've had all throughout the course of your career is stuff that, that uh, makes us feel warm, you oh, know? It, it makes us feel at home, so can't thank you enough for, for everything. You got no, but thank you guys. Just sitting in doing the good stories. That's so much fun. That's bench racing. I love it. That's awesome right. stuff. The Skinny on Paul Page. Hope you enjoyed it.